Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to Owning Up to the Urban. Um, this is our second uh, meeting this uh, semester, and um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Maria Arquero de Alarcón, and I'm based at the University of Michigan, um, teaching in the Theories and Methods of Urban Design uh, seminar, and working in collaboration with my colleague, Mona El Café. Yeah, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Maria mentioned, my name is Mona El Kafif. Uh, I'm an associate professor here at UVA. I'm um, basically, uh, Maria and I collaborated on our, both of our seminars. I'm also the director for our urban design programs, and I'm super excited that we were able to make all of this happen. Um, Maria is a dear colleague, uh, uh, let's put it this way, a very dear friend and a very respected colleague who does amazing work. So I'm really looking forward to this lecture series. And we were able to invite a group of um, very successful and talented designer theorists and educators. And we established an umbrella topic that we entitled Owning Up to the Urban. And the, the thing that the topic that we are trying to capture with this lecture series, um, is basically to address, on the one hand side, we have an incredible urbanization process occurring within the next 30 years that is going to challenge, is going to be challenged uh, by climate change and economic paradigm shifts causing growth in a lot of areas on the one hand side and shrinkage in other areas. And um, we were really looking at what are the, the emerging strategies that, that come from the design disciplines. And when we say design, we are not only talking about urban design, but we are also integrating planning architecture, landscape architecture and others. And how are, are, is the design community addressing these questions and trying to uh, maybe also see opportunities within these uh, quite challenging um, urban problems that are emerging. So we entitled it owning up to the urban as a double meaning, owning the fact that we are going to be an urban pan planet. And in order to do this, we need to own up to the problems and challenges that are coming along with it. And then also owning in the context of having power and being in ownership of, um, of specific assets. And Maria is going to talk about this uh, in, a, in a couple of seconds. So as I said, we invited, um, a group of uh, designers. And what was interesting about all of these projects is that they, they carved out new uh, agencies and new agendas for the design of the urban. And um, did this also partly without assignments that come from planning departments, et cetera, but because they saw a need of action. And there are a lot of them are translating those projects into one-to-one -one prototypes. and. We are really excited to have a very diverse of, uh, of speakers um, with us in the next, in the next weeks. Um, in order to frame the lecture series, we establish a series of questions and Maria will talk us through this. Thank you, Mona. So yeah, we wanna be part of uh, conversations with those who are actually experimenting, exploring, prototyping, um, building and bringing their ideas to fruition. And we want to know how they do it. And some of the questions that you see here that in a way is sparking uh, some of these conversations, we want to know about their work, how, you know, how do they find themselves? Are there problem solvers? Are they into critical theory? Is more about uh, enablers? Is more about advocacy? You know, how they define their agency as, as designers. At the same time, we want to know what it is that they are doing and why it matters. Are they are they fixing things? Are they healing? Are they empowering others to advance the work? We want to know about the methods, how they do it, how, how do they work, and you know everything around the how to make things uh, happen. Where are their partners? Um, where are the stakeholders, the coalitions? Where are the allies? Um, how do we know? How do we identify um, some of those um, ideal collaborators that are going to steward the projects long way and um, we are gone. At the same time, we are interested in knowing about funding, how these projects come into being. We are in a very different moment in time in which in many cases, we as designers need to also be in the capacities of writing grants and applying for funding and how that is happening, what that means for our practice as designers today. And last but not least, um, a good design is an incredible piece of research and we want to know 
how the projects may be considered replicable, transferable, what can we learn and what we see in particular places as they, their capacity to repeat, to scale up, and what are the limitations of some of these questions? Okay, so with this, just a quick overview for everyone who's visiting us today for the first time. There's a lecture series basically every Thursday, uh, except for the lecture by Nada Nafe, which uh, who's going to call in from, from Cairo and will be a lunch lecture on a, on a Wednesday. We have an amazing group of speakers coming in, so please stay tuned. Uh, um, the lecture series is posted on both of our institutions' website. But let's move forward to the guest speakers for tonight. Uh, we have Akoaki here with us, um, and we are very, very happy to have um, Jean-Louis Fargas and Anya Sirota. I will leave the introduction of our guest speakers tonight to the students, and I want to also quickly thank them. Uh, we have how you, Samrita, Deb, uh, Huiting, and Chu Yu with us. It's a mixed group of students from UVA and from Michigan. And again, thousand thanks to Kareem, our, um, our teacher, teaching assistant who is recording everything. So um, please take over and the stage is yours. Hi, I'm Huiting from, uh, uh, from University of Michigan. Uh, it's our honor to have Anya and Jane Lewis in our lecture. And firstly, I will introduce Anya Sirota and our uh, college from UVA will introduce Jane Lewis. Anya Sirota is an architecture designer, researcher, and educator. Sirota is an associate professor and associate dean at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, where she also directs the Michigan Architecture Property Studio. Sirota holds a degree from Harvard Graduate School of Design and a Bachelor in Modern Cultural and Media from Brown University. Hello, I'm Deborah. And um, so, John Louis Fargus is a designer and cultural curator working at the intersection of art, media, and architecture through. And through intensive fieldwork and collaborative process, he explores techniques for cultural activations at the urban scale. His design and photography have been published and is exhibited internationally. Prior to moving to Michigan, John Louis practiced in New York City and Paris. And now please join me as we welcome Anya and John Louis. Thank you so much. What a super introduction. And um... It's pretty fabulous to be part of this conversation. Zhongli and I have been in practice together for many years, for a decade and a half. And uh, this is our very first lecture together. So thank you for enabling us to, to try this out. <laughs> so the, could you, Anya, should I give a few words so everybody understand I have a French accent mm -hmm. right away? And uh, so the, I, I work with Anya, as she said, for 10 years. We have been uh, leading this studio, Akoaki, and uh, we are very complementary and we have di very different fields. And uh, it's uh, the complementary who makes the studio uh, uh, exciting and, and successful, I believe. So, and a quick introduction also of uh, Ishan, who is behind the scenes, and he's driving this, um, this visualization experiment. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're at his whim. So uh, sometimes we'll say next, which is the word that I hate most in lectures, but if we could move on and uh, go next, that would be great and see how this works, yeah. So now we're hovering in two different environments. I, and Ishan is making us big and small. <laughs> so my environment is uh, the interior of a room in Odessa, in a suburban part of Odessa, Ukraine, called Ginevala Petrova. And it's a Khrushchev era uh, development that uh, I grew up in for a certain amount of years before moving to the US. So this is by way of saying that I'm a post-Soviet, um, and uh, understand some of the complexities of a socialist environment 
um, and the kinds of urbanisms it breeds and uh, the kind of utopian uh, discourses associated with that kind, uh, with that aspiration. And Jean-Louis comes from a very different place. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from uh, uh, Paris. I was born in Paris, but my, I live in the suburb in, of Paris and as the opposite of U, the US, um, the, the, the working class live in, uh, in the suburb. And this is a, this picture across the street from my parents' house where you see the welcoming of the, 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 the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in this uh, environment and uh, he brought me uh, some kind of idea about design and urban and landscape, I would say. So uh, we're going to take the prompts uh, that uh, Mona and Maria introduced very seriously and kind of try to walk through them. Um, and the, the first thing that uh, we wanted to address is what kind of agency we have as designers and how, how we interact. And that takes us back a few years to the early parts of our career uh, where we started out uh, looking for our own opportunities, looking for our own clients, looking for spaces of intervention. And at this point, um, we considered ourselves uh, instigators more than anything else. We knew how to uh, launch projects uh, and how to work as uh, sort of activist architects in the, in the urban realm. And our interest was very much uh, to seek ways that uh, architecture and interventionist design might make a case for public cultural infrastructure. So um, if we move on to the next image. Um, these are the kinds of environments that we first started to work in when we moved to the uh, Michigan, Michigan context. Um, we discovered that there were many landscapes um, that uh, were either difficult to read complex to analyze and certainly fell outside of uh, the possibility of public cultural infrastructure. And yet we saw them as opportunities for intervention. So the, the image that you see here is from a project uh, called Interrobang that we worked on with students from uh, the preservation uh, course that, that we taught at the time. And this was uh, at an inflection point um, in the history of the Packard Automotive Plant in Detroit. And it, this is an Albert Kahn uh, industrial site, a kind of famous version of uh, Albert Kahn's work. And it's uh, over a kilometer long, uh, an extensive site that had been um, abandoned for over 15, 50 years. And one of the reasons it had been uh, underdeveloped was that uh, the owner of the, of the site was unknown at the time. And so when the owner became, um, when, when the owner was revealed through a series of uh, unusual events having to do with um, Banks, Banksy making a piece of art in that, in that space, um, we decided that this was a moment for an inflection point uh, that we could potentially, uh, rather than bringing this uh, site back online as a normative real estate project, we were trying to make a case that this could be a public landscape, that this could be public infrastructure. Um, did you want to add anything to that? To the setup? Yeah, the, the, it was a, an early uh, uh, concrete structure who, where the steel was over uh, scale in the, in the concrete. So the, there is no demolition possible of, the, of the, the structure, the concrete structure, but all the top floor was a steel structure. So the scrapper and, and people who need to make money on, on, on this neighborhood come over and cut a piece of the, of the building and sell it as a piece of, of metal in the, in the scrap. So the, 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 the slow demolition of, of, the, of the top floor was very impressive, very uh, um, in some way dangerous for, for everybody in the neighborhood. And we decided that because of the unique kind of, uh, of an, uh, a space knows, known everywhere in the world because the, this building is known, is known in Europe. And we wanted to show how it's important to sometime to look at structure as a, an asset, even if the decay is at this point. 
Yeah, so this is an example of um, attempting to, to walk into a situation in a pre-legal context. In other words, the space uh, was, was not a public space and to make a case for the fact that it could become uh, a public cultural infrastructure should it be treated in a collective pluralistic um, and multiplicitous way rather than slowly, slowly being traded back into a real estate scenario. So we, we worked on creating um, a project that brought the access point to, of the roof back to code and then uh, offered a space for collective intervention a space uh, for an exhibition on the roof of the Packard plant. And if we move on to the next image, um, this began with a kind of reassessment of the aesthetic and spatial values of a building that had come undone. Um, in the middle of the night, uh, Jean-Louis with a, with a team of students uh, used generators to begin to light the building to, to understand its depth and qualities and uh, material, material aspects. Uh, but also to illustrate that this is a kind of monument uh, to, to capital extraction. Like it's an accidental unsolicited monument to capital extraction um, and treating that as a space of a collective imaginary was a first step in rendering that explicit. If we move on to the next image, uh, the, the research aspects of being able to create a project where there is a temporary ephemeral intervention takes us a very long time. Uh, so perhaps in this, in this case, uh, to, to be honest, uh, the preparation for, for the project was probably three, four months in the works, uh, working with teams of students, uh, wearing safety vests um, and hard hats. Uh, moving through the site, assessing the site, understanding where this could happen, what uh, the, the messaging would be, what were the ownership models, how did we get here? How did we get to a situation where an industrial site of uh, significant architectural value had come undone to this, to this level? And how had it captured the public imaginary? How did it participate in the cultural um, projection of images of Detroit? We move on to the next image. And so uh, this involved also a series of public projects, of tours, conversations. Um, you can see very small, very small people. Uh, those are groups of people that are gathering around with our students um, and, and our friends and colleagues and partners in the project to, to, to work on understanding how to read this landscape um, and not take it for granted as a piece of uh, failed modernism. We go to the next image. Hey, Sean, there's um, <laughs> John Lee. Maybe you can speak to this. So one one of the argument of the city is that the building was more is the, the, is the how the structure was unstable. I don't know if it's like some and of course it's pretty dirty and there's a lot of pieces on the yeah. ground. So but you can see. So we draw with ice, our pickup and we went on the top floor and go but down so they're doing that so in they the building just to to see and and to understand what 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 does it mean that the structure. The is unstable when actually plan. nobody can demolish the building. So we drove down. And you can see uh, that's if you look uh, up on the ramp, video of this. Get up high uh, it could be oh, okay. very impressive. Uh, it's very unique. You don't do that every day in your life. Uh, I, I love this oh, wow. video, of yeah, course. And, kind of and the, the building was the, the scene for a lot of uh, techno music, a lot of uh, artists coming. Um, it's, it's a very, very uh, important act. It used to be a very important uh, art scene <laughs> in Detroit for four years. So the kind of documentation of action for this us... This is what scares me more is the, is the ice. To, to, so um, I don't know if it's like some weird... Like they've been patching yeah. holes with like tires and shit? Yeah. So if they patch it and it fills up with ice, you can't really tell. About all gotcha. the features for, for a site. So they're doing that so they can get up here. Um, that makes sense. And, and I think, yeah, yeah, just in case they, they, they miss it, because the very first one is on this ramp. To share from this project is um, that, that kind of moment of uh, coming together, the pluralistic um, moment where the scrappers, the academics, uh, local residents and activists find themselves in, a, in the same space. Um, and there's very little actual uh, 
you know, architectural intervention. There's a bit of furniture, there's a model of a future possibility where multiple actors have uh, imagined a future for, for the site. But the small acts of, for example, clearing the, the drain pipe on the roof, which enabled us to wash away the muck and transform the moss that had grown on the roof into a rug, those are the acts of design that we're keen on, on exploring and, and uplifting in these scenarios where there's so uh, little capital uh, to, to invest in, uh, in contrast to the, the, um, the, the need, the level of need. So if we move on to the next project, it's of a similar grain, but slightly different. Um, this one is in Chelsea, Michigan. Um, this was our very first project moving to, to the Michigan area. And uh, we had been sort of traveling around small towns uh, and just discovering the industrial landscape at a different scale than, than Detroit. And we, we came upon a recently abandoned uh, factory called Federal Screw Works. So the title itself drew our attention immediately. That was an exciting title. And as we moved uh, through the space, uh, we realized that this uh, factory was being used uh, as a civic commons for teenagers in, in Chelsea, Michigan. There were all kinds of signs that um, people were breaking in and um, spending time in, in, a, in, a, in a different way, you know, whether legal or semi-legal semi or, or slightly illegal. Um, and so we called the owner of the factory and wanted to know what the plan was. For, for this site. It was quite large. It was embedded in a residential neighborhood. And we discovered that the plan was demolition. That in the future, they, they were planning to demolish the site and build a dollar store in its place. And so we asked whether or not we could use the site as a space of uh, temporary exploration and experimentation until the date of demolition, which was down the line. And um, the owner said, yes it's yours. <laughs> there were no keys, but there was no problem for us to get in. And so in response to this question of how do we make a case for the preservation of an, uh, you know, 120,000 square foot post-industrial site that had recently gone out of commission, we decided to build a pavilion in the center, in the heart of this industrial space, in the boiler room. And uh, the image that you see us hovering over now is the interior of that uh, pavilion space, which we modeled, uh, the aspiration of it was um, a kind of poor man's, uh, a poor man's uh, light installation, a James Turrell mixed with, you know, uh, a kind of bean experience, um, but for a very, very small budget. So this is the interior view. And if we go to the next shot, uh, this is the exterior of that pavilion. So it's in the boiler room. It's attempting to grab natural light uh, from the, the, the openings in the walls that we created and from the, the roof, uh, the roof, uh, the, the glass in the roof, um, and creating an atmosphere that could be surprising or wondrous, um, despite the uh, ascetic scenario in which uh, kids in the neighborhood might find themselves in. So, John Lee, did you? Um, we... Yes, I want. I want to say that first of all, the budget for this kind of project when we started to work was very, very small. <laughs> uh, we had a support of a lot of students working with us, uh, Tomen College Lab, technology, <laughs> and uh, of course, this picture looks like pretty, uh, pretty pr pl pleasant and and but it's probably uh, 20 degrees and it's very cold. There is no heat, no water. Uh, it was it's very dirty. So to, to get this level with so little money, is, it, was, it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the idea was really to have an entrance where you only see the interior red and, and light of this, of this pavilion and you cannot see where you are in the, in the, in the, in the building. The only way to see this building, the, the space where is the pavilion is to go out, turn around and come back in this room this way. So that was a, a very intense um, uh, project. And 
I believe he was uh, successful in this uh, goal. Johnny, I think the next, if we go to the next image, it shows a little bit of the scale. Of right. This. So this is Jean-Louis standing inside of the, uh, of the pavilion, inside of the boiler room of the Federal Screw Works. And if we go to the next image, um, it shows the entry. So this is just a crack in the building um, that's inserted. It, it's hard to find. There's no signage that tells you that this is where this alternate universe is happening. And in the next image, you can also see, um, you know, where we're, we're taking people in there and we've left a, um, a box of paper booties so that people could uh, put on these paper socks and not bring the oil from the industrial site into this other alternate universe of an oasis. Um, and, you know, it's, it seems like well, that's a huge amount of effort to create uh, a singular um, phenomenological emotive moment for kids that might be, you know, uh, smoking a joint or experiencing their first kiss or uh, just wandering around an abandoned zone. But for us, this kind of act of uh, intense labor is also about making a case for a civic commons where one should find investment from, um, from the common good. So if we move to the next few images and we can move through these pretty quickly, um, Ishan, uh, the, the, the work of um, you know, uh, working without electricity, working without heat, uh, working in a context that requires us to, to reimagine what value is and how to bring value to an under-resourced site. These are all the kinds of questions that we're asking ourselves. Um, and we're bringing uh, performance art from the beginning to a space that normally wouldn't have it and attempting to make a case that it's, it's worthwhile. It's, it's worthwhile to consider the possible futures through these micro interventions. I mean, this is an image of uh, Ole Bauman who ended up coming to this um, intervention. And it was a, it was a nice moment because uh, for, for us, he's sort of the inventor of this concept of an unsolicited architecture. And at this point we were practicing what an unsolicited architecture might, might look like and how to fund it. And, and I want to add Anya then all this work started from a uh, background and, and and my background from, from Europe, where every uh, we, we consider the factory and uh, the, 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 as a uh, working class heritage. And there is, a, there is an investment in all those buildings in Europe to, to, to be preserved and to be used as a uh, space for everybody in the community, in the, in the, in the, in the cities. So is, is really the case, like Anya described it, how how we, you can look at those buildings, you can say they are in decay, but if you invest some money on it, you can really reuse them as a cultural center for, for everybody in the, in the small city. And that was really the, the goal of this project. And he, yes, that was the, the, the goal. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if, if we go back to the other, uh, to the last image, just to say that uh, once we, we create an environment typically there's a punctuation mark where we attempt to bring people together from different uh, environments, from different contexts and backgrounds to foster a conversation about the value proposition of investment in a particular place. Uh, so in the case of this uh, funny little pavilion, uh, we threw an event that we called Ruin Porn at Federal Screw Works. And this was in collaboration with a, a drummer, but also um, a Playboy bunny who had recorded her voice uh, reading ruin porn texts that were then played through the space as a, a tribute uh, to, to the, the reevaluation of aesthetic sensibilities connected to um, industrial sites. So our final image is just to say uh, from this project, Ishan, if we move forward, is just to say that this pavilion um, was in place, lodged in this boiler room for three and a half years, uh, untouched. And the only thing that we did was every so often we would replenish the booties. We would bring a new box of paper booties and nothing else happened to the, to the site. So for us, this was a kind of a case study in collective stewardship over a, an unsolicited architecture. And, and we should uh, have a little word for Stephen 
as yeah. well who work on this project with us. Yep, absolutely. And this was a project, an early project that we worked on with Stephen Christensen, who now has his own firm in Los Angeles um, and uh, is, is doing amazing work. But this was a, you know, like an early, this was our first project out of uh, school together. Totally. So if we move on. Yeah, so um, the next the next series um, is about uh, the, the way we, we think about parallel institutions. You know, once we, um, we started to, to mature out of the, the pre-legal or the activist mode, uh, we started to recognize that um, organizing uh, around networks of people, organizing people to act together uh, was a, a design proposition that was just as important as creating the artifact to speak for a particular political agenda or aesthetic position. Um, so this is where we, we began to realize that uh, the organization of um, the governance system or, or the organization of how things work uh, needs to be aligned in some ways with the artifacts and interventions that we're producing as, uh, as architects. Um, it started, if we move to the next image, with um, a project that was born out of uh, the North End in Detroit, uh, which is very close to the city center. Um, at this point, currently, it's the first stop on the Q line, so it's, it's very much in the, in the heart of the redevelopment zone. And it's a legacy African-American um, historical uh, neighborhood um, that spawned uh, vanguard ac cultural activity uh, from the mid uh, 20th century onward. Um, this was the, the place where uh, Motown musicians, funk musicians, uh, experimental musicians played and participated in vanguard activities at a, an international scale. Um, and when we started to, to work there, our question um, in, in bringing inst institutional structures to the foreground of our work was um, how could we invest and how could we create a cultural infrastructure that would render visible the invisible narratives of place uh, using a minimum budget? And how could uh, those activities bring people together to imagine alternate structures for organizing themselves um, in, in the city and in space? I think I, I want to add, Anya, then this is a neighborhood, and I don't know if everybody knows the, the, the Trois and if you have been there, but this is one, one of the neighborhoods where 70% of the structure are gone. Mm -hmm. That means the, the neighborhood history has been lost through a lot of buildings who have been demolished by the city or by fire. And so the first time we went there, there is no light in the street. There is uh, some em emptiness in the in the in the building, and we start to talk with the the resident who has who have not left the, the, the neighborhood, and you start to understand the whole story, and how uh, he was one of the lead leader cultural leader in in Detroit, and it doesn't look like this anymore, and and so this is, it was really a, a, a challenge for us to figure out how you can start and uplift the narrative of all this history when, when, when you look at it and when you drive inside this neighborhood, you, don't, you cannot see that anymore. And how, how the, 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 the design, urban design could help to bring this narrative outside. So that was really a, a surprising and astonishing space for us to, to, to learn. So we, we started by building uh, ginormous models. This is a clip from a 36 foot model uh, that we built so that people could begin to relate their stories and narratives um, and their cultural imaginaries. Uh, people would be able, were able to point to particular lots uh, in the neighborhood and tell us exactly what used to be there. Um, and this was a working document for us to, to imagine and understand uh, the, the value of uh, continuous and engaged cultural heritage uh, in the neighborhood. So if we move to the next slide, uh, as a consequence, we ended up building um, 
a, a mobile uh, DJ booth and space capsule because we had learned so much about the value of music and uh, music culture in the neighborhood, specifically having to do with the birth of funk music. And as a tribute to uh, Parliament Funkadelic and George Clinton, uh, who had uh, transformed into a, a major cultural figure in this neighborhood, um, we decided to, to render that story explicit by creating a very lightweight, mobile, easy to transport um, artifact where uh, DJs and performers could stage their own narratives and uh, recount their own histories. And if we move to the next slide, Rishan. And then the, the title of this project, which was uh, for us, even though it's a, it's a series of interventions, we thought about this really as an urban guiding plan. Um, we called the project One Mile. And this was a riff on the idea that before Eight Mile, there was an origin story to music um, in, in the city of Detroit. And then we called it One Mile also because of the Oakland North End um, Mile. Uh, which was literally the the dimensions of the intervention of the urban intervention. So you you see the you see uh, like as described, this is a neighborhood who has been collapsing, and seventy percent of the building are gone. There is no uh, cultural structure, even if if this is one of the most historic neighborhood in Detroit. So the 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 goal for us was at the launch of the of the mothership is to invite musicians who play. Uh, with uh, George Clinton, P Funk, and and do an event, some almost an underground event. So there was no public invitation. It was really try to have uh, the neighborhood and people who knows the the, the history to come over. And uh, it was one night we launched the mothership, and it was like maybe four hundred people who came. Um, and uh, of course, it was a very successful uh, launch um, for this project. And again, as a prototype for cultural infrastructure, and as we move to the next slide, um, the idea was that this artifact could illustrate that number one, there was talent, and that that talent was continuous, and that there was cultural production that had not moved out of the neighborhood despite the aggressive blight remediation from, um, from the part of the city. Um, and also that there was an audience, that there was an audience for this kind of activity and for the cultural infrastructure uh, that was possible there. So for us, this is a lightweight um, attempt to illustrate the need, the possibility and the capacity for a particular site and a particular neighborhood to sponsor um, the activities that we have a hunch are the emergent programs of a, of a particular site or space or neighborhood. So the, the mothership was designed to be lightweight and to be able to host a plethora of cultural activities and to move between um, vacant uh, sites, different architectural scenarios, um, but, but activate a plethora of spaces using a minimal amount of means. And if we move to, to the next slide and launch the video. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. thank you. <laughs> So this is a video of a gar of the garage where the mothership um, lived uh, for some for some time. The original plan was for it to be there for about six months, and uh, ultimately it lived in this garage for four years. And do you want to talk about what we're seeing? So it's very important to, to describe how the mothership could be open and could have a DJ inside. So that's that. This on this uh, event morning it was uh, it was a band of ladies, uh, lead and created by Emily Rogers. She's the bass player. She's in the, close to the mother. She you can see her, and uh, she's a very uh, uh, important figure in Detroit, in uh, in the scene of uh, hip hop and uh, heavy metal as well. <laughs> and she touched a lot of uh, um, style of music, and all those. Those performers are all from Detroit, and they play everywhere in the U.S. Like people in Detroit, musicians say there is no music performance in the U.S. where there is no one musician from Detroit. And so that was the example of performance underground as well, 
but as a proof of concept, then if you have a cultural center in this neighborhood, it will work pretty well. So if we move to the next slide, Sean, <laughs> I'm doing the thing that I promised I would never do, use the word next slide, I'm sorry. You but, can do that in French, prochaine. Yeah. So in, in this, in, <laughs> in this um, series of parallel institutions, the one that you're all, uh, that you're using as your backdrop um, is the nomadic uh, cultural council arch that we designed. Um, uh, with uh, input from, from uh, many artists and activists uh, in Detroit who were lamenting the closure and loss of uh, an arts council in Detroit. The arts council was, was closed even before the city's bankruptcy. And even though the city really instrumentalizes its culture and art practices in order to envision uh, a, 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 an equitable regeneration of neighborhoods, Artists very much felt underrepresented and undersupported uh, in Detroit because there was uh, no officialized uh, government uh, entity to, to support their efforts. And so this clip on arch was designed to um, ephemerally, temporarily transform underused spaces into um, glitzy, uh, you know, uh, vanguard spaces of, of cultural attraction, but also to, to legitimize and to uh, draw attention to a cause. We go to the next slide. So here we are back at the garage and this time we're, we're testing what, how, how the, the clip on uh, ephemeral nomadic <laughs> art for the cultural council could possibly work and what kind of um, conversations, events, and publics it can draw uh, and, and what kind of attention it can draw to the matter. So um, the way that we build these structures is extremely um, lightweight and again, economical in every way. Uh, we try to make these uh, artifacts look as, um, let's say, um, Im, you know, important or blingy as possible. But, but in essence, we're looking at something that is replicable for uh, under $200 from a mold that we, that we built in our uh, barn and in our garage. And we're just using uh, plastic painted with gold sheen to create the artifice of, of a, a truly permanent uh, cultural infrastructure. Uh, so here we are, all of the pieces that we put together in these installations are typically the scale of a flatbed truck um, so that we can move them around uh, neighborhoods and attach them to, to various buildings. It's the same case for the mothership. Every piece of the mothership is exactly the scale of our truck. And then we also would bring the furniture around in the same truck in order to host these events. And so once you clip on the arch, and uh, oops, and you clip on, and you and you begin to to furnish um, and uh, cultivate the possibilities of a particular place. People come together, conversations are kindled, attention begins to be paid to a particular uh, aspect of uh, community need, and uh, the instigation for action takes place there. Do you want to add anything to this project? Um, no, um, I, I want to say um, there, there is a part of, of our work, and we will probably talk about that a little bit later on in this uh, presentation, but um, Detroit is an African-American city with 85% of uh, African-American, and uh, we have been um, very working, working precisely to try to have the most diverse uh, kind of audience. And uh, you can see in this image, and you, can, you have seen that in the, the image before, is like the challenge to, to include everybody and, and has been a um, very large part of our work. And the more we, we work in Detroit, and more he has been uh, the, the driver and, and uh, 
the the challenge in the same way for for us to 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 get this this audience uh, as diverse as possible so we are continuing to um build these parallel cultural institutions even despite our disembodied situation currently um so this is an example uh, of uh, acts of urbanism which is an ephemeral um, cultural institution that's digital at this at this point that brings together um, artists from Detroit, Grenoble in France and Saint-Étienne to be able to collaborate on producing a more nuanced understanding of urban conditions uh, that move beyond simply a kind of demographic analysis of a context, uh, but begin to, to insinuate that through arts, culture and collective production in the urban realm, we might get to a, a finer grain of an understanding of capacity, need, um, and uh, cultural scenario building. So uh, we're going to unpack the tools of our trade as we move to the next slide. So we wanted to, to share a little bit about uh, how we produce these projects and, and what our what are the tools that we turn to in order to uh, solicit uh, broad engagement? So as we move to the next slide, um, we shape many of our projects or we begin to shape our projects through events and programming. Uh, this is a sonography from uh, the Detroit Funkestra, which was a, an open air opera staged in the middle of um, the Oakland Avenue urban farm. And here it's transported to the Saint-Étienne Biennale. If we move to the next slide, um, this is an, an image of a fragment of that uh, scenography. And in many ways, it's, it's a kind of hauntological project. In, in other words, that we're reciting a number of uh, vanguard cultural institutions that are disappearing in the North End or have disappeared. And we're literally picking the color and the shapes from those spaces and hybridizing them to create a new scenographic construct. Whether someone understands where those signifiers come from is less important that it feel, than that it feels um, pertinent and bound to a sense of place. So it's not a direct translation, it's a kind of uh, homage or a distanced citation of an original signifier. So with these kind of scenographies, if we go to the next slide, we again engage with, um, with artists, performers uh, in a particular context to animate and to recount narratives that the architectural object in and of itself is incapable of doing. Next. So, <laughs> From the design point of view, of course, so we have always very uh, strong influence about this feeling of a 2D flat image, then you turn it around and you become a 3D. That's a very important part of our work. Um, the structural uh, prowess, I don't know if I can use that in English, prowess, but is, is always a, a, a part of the of the chat, the discussion and conversation with all the students in architecture. That's mean I'm always, we are always pushing the, 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 the boundary of structure and with the cheapest material possible because the, the, the stage and the, those, those uh, events are not done to last forever, but they need to have an effect and a narrative very powerful. So that's very always interesting for everybody. On the, on the all the team on the on the on the on the, on the construction how to reach uh, the most important effects so the the discussion and the, the image could be the most powerful for everybody and so the these kinds of events um, they translate for us into a desire to produce um, more uh, long term more stable uh, cultural infrastructure. And so we're, we're making a case that it's possible and that the network of people is there. Uh, for example, the Funkestra Opera was uh, staged at the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. And this is a model of that project, which is a six acre 
uh, urban commons in the same uh, neighborhood that uh, we had been working in for, for some years. And it's the first land trust in Detroit, um, which is a, a, a great surprise to us, but also a phenomenal accomplishment of being able to bring so many people together with common ideological goals in order to secure um, a public or a, a, a pu public facing landscape that can be preserved in the middle of the, of the neighborhood. Um, so uh, when we create these, these projects, which are very slow cooked, we also um, explore the possibility of broader engagement when they're revealed. So if we go to the next image, so this uh, project, uh, the, the Civic Commons, is also known as the Detroit Cultivator Project. Um, and it had a big ambition to become sustainable ecologically, economically, and culturally. And um, for that, we really turned to understanding how speculation works in Detroit, uh, imitating some of the processes by which speculators acquire land working with a collective of uh, urban advocates, uh, social entrepreneurs, farmers, and others in order to purchase slowly but surely the six acres and to gift them to the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm uh, and then to transform them into a, a land trust. And if we can move on. This is really um, the work that Jean-Louis has been doing very closely. So if, if you're interested in urban farming, he's really the the person who has uh, gr the greatest level of expertise. Um, and uh, this project attempted to reimagine all of the vacant uh, architecture on site and uh, give it new meaning, give it new possibility in order to support uh, the, the farming and the food production, which uh, economically is, is very difficult to, to render sustainable. I, I'd like to add, uh the time for those kind of projects. Like there is a, I don't know if I can use the word evolution between when we start 10 years ago in Detroit and, and uh, the last few years, because interest in land and structure in the city of Detroit has been uh, more uh, intense. And uh, the, the farm used to, to grow food for give access to fresh food for the, the residents of the neighborhood. But most of the land was owned by the land by the city of Detroit, and so there, there, is, there was a lot of speculation. So slowly we worked together with the farm to design a master plan and try to have a very strategic way to acquire and, and have the, the farm become the owner of the land and, and to protect this land. This is how we came up with this this uh, option. Then land trust is the most important part in 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 uh, against uh, gentrification or displacement um so that that was that's a very uh, this is a work in in progress we work uh, very intensely about that like anya said the farm is the owner of uh, six acres most of the land is transferred in the land trust nobody can never sell it anymore it's going to be protected for 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 the new generation and it's going to be green space for 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 most of it so this kind of planning, the behind the scenes planning, just to launch the project, we're talking about a couple of years of just strategic organizing in order to get to a point where this can become a public knowledge uh, because there is a fear that um, others might begin to purchase and speculate on land in order to flip it and, and to turn a profit. So um, again, returning to this idea of why create events, why worry about programming, if we go to the next slide, um, when, it, when it is time to render explicit what the strategy has been of a collective organization, the next step is to bring others into conversation with that effort in order not to create a feudalist system that's embedded within a larger urban fabric, but to invite others to begin to inflect and shape that project. Um, so this is an image from an event that we staged called Crop Up. Um, which uh, invited uh, neighborhood residents, foundations, um, artists, activists, and others uh, to interact with the work that had been done so far, and then to, to invite others to participate in the project. You know, inviting uh, chefs, 
uh, and artists to do installations and feedback around the, the, the model and the scale of the intervention, introducing the drawings, uh, the drawing set and the possibilities of how the, uh, the, exist the existing buildings could be reimagined. And again, always turning to um, performance and to exuberance as a way to counter uh, some of the uh, economic difficulties of place. And then if we just go to the, to the video, um, and again, using performance art, inviting uh, uh, agriculture or uh, farmers to work in collaboration with performance artists and social entrepreneurs. Here we're seeing this uh, tiny video that, I, that we shot with a cell phone of um, three types of people engaging together in the creation of instruments made out of uh, agricultural tools in order to launch a performance art piece in one of the buildings that's adjacent to the site um, and just sort of uh, illustrating that we can begin to blur disciplinary lines in order to imagine possible collective futures. So how do we tell all of these stories? If we go to the next slide. One, one thing that we turn to is broadcast. So we make objects that tell stories or that work as sonography so that others can tell stories. Uh, but then we also publish those stories or we self-publish those stories in blingy magazines um, in ways that we can uh, both narrate existing conditions and future, and future uh, possibilities. Next slide. And so uh, it, over the years, we've produced uh, lots of different publications and these publications have always attempted to um, side with the sensibilities of say, a September issue of Vogue. Like we try to use very shiny paper. Uh, we incorporate uh, lots of uh, faux advertising. So for example, uh, businesses in, in the community might have advertising for, for uh, efforts that are not quite fully formed, but it allows again, the possibility of um, having uh, small businesses appear more finished or more, more um, installed than they really are. Uh, so we combine narratives about contemporary moments about the reality of place with narratives that are future forward uh, that, that look at the way people would like to, to imagine their neighborhoods. Anything else about publications, Jean-Louis? No, okay. Well, I have a background as a photographer, so a lot of image are part of my work, as well as the design with Anya. So um, we think about these interventions as self-proliferating photomotons. So it's like if you create an object that people would like to disseminate themselves with, then you begin to um, replicate stories about the intersection between architecture and its juxtaposition to a particular context. So we've tested this in a variety of ways. This is an installation in Hollywood um, at uh, uh, the Wuho Gallery on Hollywood Boulevard where we thrust, this is also a project with Stephen Christensen, an early project where we thrust a star through uh, a series of uh, very inexpensive slices of wood to see whether we could draw greater attention to an architecture gallery that seemed overlooked given the context, the gaudy co context of Hollywood. And if we go to the next slide, this is an image of what the exterior of that, um, of that building looks like. So lodged between a smoke shop and another smoke shop, I think, um, really quite, quite difficult to view, but these, these inexpensive interventions begin to, to suggest that we can visualize spaces that are vernacular or uh, over, overlooked uh, simply by using graphic PAL. So if we look to the next slide, um, what we simply invited people to do was to occupy the space and um, consequently uh, they created images of themselves in that space and began to disseminate them profusely uh, through social media and we were able to test and track what that kind of graphic intervention can produce. 
So um, another technique or another tool that we use um, is the creation of urban markers. Again, very inexpensive moves um, where if there is a site that wants to announce its future possibilities, we work carefully to produce an artifact that can show its spatial capacities and spatial possibilities. So we worked in Anéi, France, um, at Les Tanneries, an abandoned tannery uh, factory, uh, to create an intervention to show the spatial possibility of a um, factory or a space come undone. Uh, so working there, we decided uh, to build two vernacular stars in situ using uh, stick construction, essentially, um, and to illustrate how um, the, the grace of the open space might be conserved for a plethora of, of uses. If we go to the next slide, we'll see those, those two stars, the protagonists in this play, uh, hovering over the tannery tanks and also occupying the beams. But one of the, the roles, one of the features of creating these kinds of urban markers, first they announce to uh, people in neighborhoods or in particular contexts that something is changing, that there's an opportunity to reimagine the spatial capacities of a site but it also creates a graphic identity that can then be disseminated to tell the story of the place. So um, we, as we go to the next slide, we think of those graphic identities both as um, disseminating the story, but also testing uh, or it creating empathy for a particular place. And um, it's another way for us to think about inexpensive ways of um, uh, replicating a narrative but also investing in the telling of the story in more um, traditional contexts. So this, for example, is a tactic that, we've, that we used um, when we worked with the tannery that considered itself, uh, a, not to say a grade B institution, but one that had a small, much smaller budget than say the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Um, we created tote bags that we then inserted into the Palais de Tokyo's uh, uh, gift shop uh, and, and Ishan, if you can point me to the to the bag with the star. <laughs> you, yeah, so you see our tote bag is a little bit shorter than the official tote bags at Palais de Tokyo, so we did make a mistake. But as soon as we put the, the tote bags into the Palais de Tokyo, which sold for eight euros, uh, there was an extreme amount of excitement about this project that was uh, uh, in, in the margins of, of the Parisian uh, area. So it was a, it's an hour and a half away from the Pal Palais de Tokyo but suddenly it was legitimated through the, its uh, graphic relationship uh, to a more institutionalized space. I think there is a name in English, it's called guerrilla marketing. <laughs> yeah, it's guerrilla marketing, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we do, we do this kind of, if we go to the tote, we do these kinds of uh, acts of taking spaces or projects uh, that normally might not uh, make the, their way into a, a market economy and uh, illustrating that they have capacity to, to play well with others. Next, please. And again, we look to emergent programs. In any context, in any context that we work, we believe that there is already an activity of value and consequence that's happening and it's the role of the designer and the urbanist to figure out what that activity is and to roll it into and embed it into the project um, and to, to unify it with uh, other uses and capacities of a site. So we're always looking to figure out first and foremost what is already happening there to ensure that it can be included. If we move on. So our, our mode of representation for us is another tool. Um, when we draw these kinds of um, images, we're working very hard to make them as legible um, as possible. Uh, our scale figures are all people who are involved in the projects. Um, so there's uh, nothing is innocent about the production of these kinds of images. Uh, the vegetation we draw from Henry Rousseau and from uh, Miles Davis record albums. Uh, again, a kind of hauntological need to make people um, feel that this could be familiar rather than uh, simply professional. 
This is a section of uh, Red's Jazz Shoeshine, for example, at the farm, one of the projects that are part of the Civic Commons. And uh, the next section is uh, the landing, which is a, a, a residential home that the farm is looking to refashion as a hostel for, for youth visiting the farm. And in all of these images, if you were to zoom in, for example, even the wallpaper is designed um, by, by in collaboration with uh, artists and people that are part of the project. And the artwork on the wall is also uh, artwork that's being produced in the neighborhood. Again, attempting to make a case um, that this isn't uh, a generic whitewashing of existing infrastructure, but that it can begin to house the specifics of activity. Next. And uh, yeah, and this is the, the, the big box, the, the little big box uh, store that's also part of the um, Civic Commons at the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm. So I, if we go to the next image, and again, with this question of uh, representation and uh, how, how we try to clarify and represent the projects that we do, uh, Jean-Louis and I also wanted to share a little bit about how we fund this work because it's, it's playful, it's exuberant, and how do we do it? Um, so partially, uh, this is funded through, and significantly, this is funded through foundations. So this is uh, work that aligns somewhat with um, instrumentalized art practices. Um, it's also funded through socialist governments. So uh, when we work in, in France, for example, that's a very different uh, format. Um, that's that's uh, projects being funded through the cultural ministry. Um, and we are also supported through, um, through educational institutions, through the academy. You know, the, the reason why we, we can, we have the capacity to, to take some of the risks that we do is because ultimately the academy functions as a, um, minor uh, so socialist regime in and of itself. It creates a safety blanket for experimentation. Okay, so the final chapter is, if we move forward, is can we scale this up? You know, these are uh, exuberant micro experiments, but what next, <laughs> you know, can this be, uh, this kind of attitude and these kinds of strategies, can they be uh, attached or applied to an institution? Uh, can they be applied even to uh, an urban design project? And we'd like to make the case that yes, that, that it, it is possible and it's, it's even, um, it, it produces certain, uh, certain productive effects. So if we move to the next slide. Um, most recently, uh, about a year and a half ago now, we took part in a competition uh, to reimagine how to connect the cultural district in Midtown Detroit. And we're looking at uh, an 80 acre site. No, it's like, it's less than that. It's about a 70 acre site with 12 institutions, individual autonomous institutions, including the Detroit Institute of Art, uh, the Detroit Public Library, uh, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Uh, there's a building that belongs to uh, the University of Michigan, the Rackham Center. Um, the Wayne State University is there. So just a, a plethora of differently scaled um, institutions. And the, the competition called for a strategy to bring these actors and these, uh, the, these spaces together and to unify them into a dynamic collective landscape. So we did something kind of unusual. And Ishan, if we could move on to the, the next slide. Rather than um, producing uh, a, a strategy that was a formal strategy, we introduced a series of elements that could be negotiated between the partners. Uh, so we looked at the, at the site and we suggested that perhaps a square, a pedestrian square could begin to bind and uh, lend legibility to the district. And then we introduced the idea of an axial band or a series of ephemeral plazas that could house large scale activities um, at the center of that district. And we also uh, began to think about how we would need to um, treat something that we considered the ecotone or the space where 
uh, water management and biodiversity and a thickened um, ecological buffer could produce a differently scaled environment. And then we also uh, imagined a necklace binding the ecotone together and creating smaller scale activities in the, in the district. And of course, um, all of the health of this scheme with its elements would be contingent on how each institution plugged in. So we suggested that uh, the, the team would be able to work with each institution in order to calibrate those elements to their personal needs, but also to plan forward and see how their architecture might connect to the, to the guiding plan. And against all odds, uh, this project was selected, which meant that it came with uh, an extensive uh, uh, research and development and schematic design and engagement uh, uh, period, which we're in the midst of currently, um, meaning that we're working with each individual institution to figure out what they're willing to share, how they're envisioning uh, collective governance, how they imagine uh, sort of share, sharing in, in collective infrastructure, reimagining mobility, reimagining um, what parking might look like in a district, and then also projecting how each institution sees itself five, 10 years down, down the road in order to ensure that um, this plan is as sustainable as possible and as equitable as possible, despite the various budgetary requirements and capacities of each institution. So if we move to the next slide. And so this, this is the, you know, a drawing that keeps getting redrawn. It's, a, it's, a, it's very much a work in progress. It's literally, we pull and we push and we negotiate each piece of this plan and it's been in progress now for a year. And I think, you know, we're looking to get it to a place where everyone feels comfortable, uh, probably before the end of the summer. But it's that kind of same um, networking and building of, of, um, of relationships and negotiations uh, that the project instigates. So these are uh, a few images of streets that are, and, and you know, these are streets that are making space for a pedestrian activity uh, by virtue of moving automobiles off of the uh, off of the main streets. And Ishan, as we just moved quickly through these, we're creating that that ecological buffer uh, where wilderness can be reinserted into the urban realm, uh, where the the frame of the plan allows for programmatic spillage. Uh, from the interior of the institutions into the exteriors, softening the thresholds between the institutions and the landscape, blurring the boundaries between architecture and landscape to the best of our ability, creating space for uh, cultural expression um, that can be shifting and can be deliberated and governed with multiple entities producing the landscape. Um, imagining the way that uh, commercial or cultural activity can be brought to the, the surface, uh, brought to the edge of institutions that have up until now been sort of hermetically sealed. And even in Detroit, the Motor City reimagining uh, the arteries, uh, slowing down traffic and even shutting down on occasion, the traffic that pulsates through the city in order to make space for cultural events. And so, you know, how do we do this? We use the same uh, techniques and the same tools that we learned from our micro interventions. Our office is a storefront that invites uh, activity from the street and hosts a plethora of, of different um, animated uh, programs in order to engage the broadest number of constituents. Um, if we go to the next image, we still in from different organizations and groups uh, to, to intervene and to give us their feedback and to ensure that um, there are as many voices in a project like this as possible. Ishan, if we move forward. Okay, so yeah, the model, we can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, 
how does that work again during uh, the, this uh, difficult time of COVID? Um, we work by, by creating an online presence that begins or attempts to simulate some of the, our physical activities in digital space. So again, this is the little blue box shows um, a digital model that we built that works like Bing. Um, we're, uh, we're using it as a pinup board to invite people to be able to click through the project in progress, which is very unusual to be able to cultivate conversations between all of the stakeholders to ensure that everyone feels that it's transparent and that they're represented and that they can keep up with um, the conversations as they're taking place. We also are working to, to host events. Uh, Maria was a, a part of one of them, which was amazing. And uh, again, inviting conversations between uh, different actors in the city um, in order to, to get the maximum amount of feedback and to ensure that there's a cultural line that um, creates the sensibility and the idiosyncratic um, aspects of place. And so um, we've learned quite a few lessons uh, from, from our micro interventions and we take them very seriously. And you know, as if we were to, to talk to you as our early designers, um, those, those micro projects that were built on a shoestring, they have in many ways influenced uh, the way that we think about uh, broader, broader projects in the urban realm.